This morning, I am very pleased to have with us our keynote speaker, Brother Justin Constantine, who's a 1990 initiate of the Lambda Sigma chapter at James Madison University. Brother uh, Constantine is a Lieutenant Colonel in the Marine Corps with 16 years of active and reserve service. He volunteered for his deployment in Iraq in 2006, excited to lead other Marines and help rebuild that war-torn part of the world. While on a routine combat patrol, an enemy sniper shot Justin in the head, causing catastrophic damage, destroying his jaws and much of his face. Thanks to the heroic efforts of a young Navy corpsman and his own warrior spirit, Brother Constantine is still alive today. Since his injury, Brother Constantine has continued to lead from the front and serve as a role model to other wounded warriors. Brother Constantine's personal awards include the Purple Heart, the Meritorious Service Medal, the Combat Action Ribbon, and the Navy and Marine Corps Commendation Medal. Justin is an entrepreneur, published author, and member of the National Speakers Association. After his injuries, Justin was the honor graduate of his class at the Marine Corps Command and Staff College and is now pursuing an advanced law degree at Georgetown University. In 2011, the Wounded Warrior Project presented Justin with their prestigious annual George C. Lang Courage Award, and he now sits on their board of directors. In 2012, the Commonwealth of Virginia passed legislation commemorating his commitment to wounded warriors and other veterans. He's the recipient of the Commitment to Service Award from given hours and is a member of their board of directors as well. The Secretary of Defense appointed Justin to a four-year congressionally mandated task force for recovering warriors, and he's been invited to the White House on several occasions. Through his journey of courage, injury, resilience, and triumph, Brother Constantine demonstrates that we are all stronger than we think we are. His personal story of recovery and success is a testament to the power of the human spirit, and the message he shares applies to all of us here in the audience. All will leave inspired to attack any difficulties in your own lives and will search out opportunities to excel at work, at home, and in your chapter. Today, Brother Constantine will stand before you. He stands for honor, for service, and for commitment to his flag. Brothers, please give a warm welcome to Brother Justin Constantine. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for that very warm welcome, but my mom would tell you to wait till I actually say something before you get excited to see me up here. Who knows what I'll say. But Good morning, and thank you very much for inviting me to your leadership conference. It's an honor for me to be here with you. Um, I have about 15 or 20 minutes to talk with you, so I want to spend some time talking about my experiences before and after the deployment to Iraq, and also talk to you a little bit about the Wounded Warrior Project. As you heard, I graduated from James Madison University in 1992. Uh, while I was there, I pledged a pledge of return in the second semester of my sophomore year. But also while I was in college, I played rugby for four years, I worked at the school gym, and I was part of the student government. Kappa Sig was the only fraternity that I rushed, and, and I enjoyed every minute of my experience there. I was a grand procurator during my senior year, I lived in a fraternity house that senior year as well. So a lot of great friendships there, have a lot of funny stories about my time in Kappa Sig then, and that continues today. Next month, I'm going on an annual golf trip that about 20 or 24 of us do every year so we can get together, um, talk about some stories when we were your age and the things we were doing, and then just catching up on each other's lives. Uh, we went on a lot of road trips when we were in college, even down to headquarters down to UVA, so a lot of good stuff. I joined the Marine Corps after my second year of law school. I went to law school at University of Denver. I think uh, we have a Denver chapter here. I hope so. Um, when I deployed to Iraq, though, it wasn't in the role of a JAG officer. In the Marine Corps, all the officers are in the basics of many different positions. So I had the honor 
Um, I deployed as a civil affairs team leader. In that capacity, I had the honor of leading a small team of eight Marines. And here's where we are. I know what you're thinking. Why is Brad Pitt over there on the left-hand side uh, there with Justin's squad? Just some other really good-looking guy. I was fortunate. I had the honor of leading a small team. Most, most of my Marines were your age. They, they were, we were all reservists. A lot of them were students at George Mason University in Fairfax, Virginia. A lot of them had already been to Iraq before, so I could lean on them heavily when we were trying to accomplish our mission. As a civil affairs officer, I was responsible for developing contracts with the local Iraqi leadership to help rebuild the infrastructure that had been destroyed. A lot of you are familiar with some of the pictures. The electricity that doesn't work, no clean running water, terrible roads and, and schools that were a disaster. So that's the type of thing we were trying to work on there. Unfortunately, as some of you may know, the fall of 2006 was an incredibly uh, volatile and challenging time for the Marine Corps there in Iraq. The insurgency was at its most powerful level. Convincing the local Iraqis to work with us was virtually impossible because they would be visited at night with very real death threats from those insurgents. That being said, I'll always look back on my time in Iraq as a highlight of my, of my career. Not many lawyers get the opportunity to leave Marines in a combat environment. I learned a lot about myself and about leadership while I was there. Now, I don't want to get too serious too quickly here, but when I look out and see you, and, and your, to me, your young faces, I can't help but think about a lot of the Marines who I knew in Iraq and our battalion at that time. A lot of them were your age, or even younger, because some of them were just a year or two out of high school. I'll never forget a memorial service we had one day there for six young Marines who were all killed in the same day fighting the enemy. It was particularly sad to me. Instead of six Marines out in the front of the room getting, getting an award, it was six sets of boots and rifle and dog tags and, and helmets that you're all familiar with. And so I won't forget that. But I'm also not going to forget, and when I look out at you, I, I remember the two young men who were your age who saved my life over there. And I'm going to get to them in just a minute. As Marines, we do many things very well. But one thing in particular is that we take care of each other. And as leaders within Kappa Sigma, I think that's something that you care about very much as well. In fact, I wouldn't be here today if it weren't for the Marines around me on October 18, 2006, as well as an amazing Navy corpsman. Now, because I worked closely with a battalion commander, he put me on what he called a jump team, which was comprised of about a dozen of us who worked closely together, and we went out across the wire, out into contested territory, about four or five times per week. We are, on that day, we were out on a regular combat patrol, and we got to an area where we knew an enemy sniper had been operating, because he had already killed a few of our Marines, shot him in the face. But of course, that wasn't going to get in the way of our mission. Now, we are near one of our forward operating bases, or FOBs as we called them. And here's a picture of it. As you can see, it's actually a really nice house in a neighborhood that we had up armored. We had paid the family to move out to another part of the city. We used forward operating bases like this as launching pads for offensive operations, for intelligence gathering missions, and also so we could live amongst the Iraqis and help defend and protect them uh, from those insurgents I mentioned. Now, we actually had a reporter with us that day, and he and others have reiterated to me what happened because I don't remember most of it. I know that we stopped by an Iraqi police station that morning. They had been shot up the night before, and my colonel wanted to talk with our police chief about how to better defend their position. Then we stopped at another one of our files that I, I never liked going to. It was unprotected, it was on, the, it was, uh, it was on an overpass, of a major traffic intersection. Everyone knew we were there. I never liked going there. And I guess I noticed that at that time the reporter was just kind of standing still, which is obviously the last thing you want to do if you know there's a sniper in the area. He and I were riding in the same vehicle, so we went to our next stop. And there's a guy that hummed in and walked away from him. I said to him, hey, Jay, you need to move quicker here. Don't forget about that sniper. We don't want you to get injured. He told me that based on me saying that to him, he took a big step forward. And a split second later, a round came in right where his head had been and hit the wall between us. 
before I could react, the next round came in and hit me behind my left ear and exploded out of my mouth, causing incredible damage along the way. In fact, when the Navy corpsman came running over, the Marines around me said, don't worry about the Major, he's dead. Now, I don't blame them for that. By all objective measures, look at me, they were right. But George Grant is an amazing young man. And he proceeded to save my life. Even though blood was pouring out of my head and what was left in my face, he was able to focus solely on me and keeping me alive. In the face of overwhelming adversity and with complete disregard for his own life, George took care of me that day. He performed rescue breathing on me somehow, even though the bullet had come out of my mouth. And he also cut open my throat and performed an emergency tracheotomy on me so I wouldn't drown in my own blood. In fact, despite all that was going on around him, including that sniper was still trying to shoot the other Marines who were in our squad. And this wasn't a hostile environment, obviously. This was a battlefield. There was dirt and rocks and stones and dust and sand everywhere. And George was wearing 65 pounds of protective armor, like we all were that summer. And I'm sure he was sweating like crazy because it was over 100 degrees there every day. Despite all that, <clears throat> George did such a perfect job in my tracheotomy that my classy surgeon later at Bethesda, the military hospital, thought another surgeon had performed it. Now keep in mind, George had never performed this operation on a human being before. He had only done it once, and it was on a pig in a controlled training environment at Camp Pendleton, in California. So I don't know what that says about me, but the pig survived, I survived. I'm not going to you know, ask too many questions about that. The important thing, though, for you is, guess what? George is 24 years old at the time, so probably just a couple years older than you guys. George is a perfect example of the impact someone in your age group can have on the people around him. Now, I'm going to show you a picture. It's a graphic picture uh, from when I was injured. It's about a week after I was injured. This is from the uh, operating table back when I was at... Uh, Bethesda. So at this point, I already had several surgeries. What George saw was a lot worse than this. When I was shot, the commanding officer of the infantry battalion, Colonel DeGrosse, was faced with a tough decision. Should he call in a medical evacuation, but not really knowing how long it would take for the helicopter to get there because of competing interests all over the battlefield? Or should he risk one of the roadside bombs and have someone drive me to the aid station in an effort to, to save me. Now, as you know from the news coverage in Afghanistan, the improvised explosive devices, or IEDs, are everywhere. They're very powerful and they're very easy to hide. Well, we, we face that same situation. We literally hit them every day in Iraq. Colonel de Rose opted for Lance Corporal Jordan Bueller, a young Marine from New Orleans, to drive me to the aid station. And he told him to drive me as fast as possible. Lance Corporal Bueller was 19 years old at the time. Now, driving 70 miles an hour is no big deal here in the States. We obviously do that all the time. But in Iraq, we have a standing order to never drive faster than 15 miles per hour everywhere we went. We had learned the hard way that if you hit an IED going faster than that, you dramatically increase the chances of causing your vehicle to flip end over end and probably kill everyone inside that vehicle. But just like Coleman Grant had done minutes earlier, Lance Corporal Jordan Bueller put his own life on the line for me and drove me 70 miles an hour to get me to that aid station in what they call the golden hour, which is so critical after a traumatic injury. In fact, here's a picture I took of one of our vehicles about a week or two before that that had hit one of those IEDs on the road there. Jordan Bueller at that time wasn't even old enough to drink beer legally, but this is the kind of sacrifices he was making for those around him. So why am I up here in front of you today? I can't see out of my left eye anymore. I, can't, I have difficulty running because the doctor took bones from my legs to reconstruct my upper and lower jaw. I'm missing most of my teeth and the end of my tongue, and as I'm sure you can tell already, I can't speak perfectly clearly. I also suffer from a traumatic brain injury and post-traumatic stress. But you know what? I'm the luckiest person in this whole room. Because of the injury that caused these problems, I'm now far closer with my wife, Dahlia, than I ever would have imagined. 
I know I'm far stronger than I ever would have thought possible, and I can now put everyday problems in their proper perspective so I can focus on what's truly important to Dahlia and me. Winston Churchill once said, never, never, never give up. And I try to firmly, firmly embrace that philosophy during my recovery, and I think it applies to everyone in this room as well. None of you can ever give up on your values and fellowship that we hold dearly as members of this fraternity. None of you can ever give up being your brother's keeper and supporting each other when necessary. And none of you can ever give up on the ideas of community service and having a positive impact on others around you. Over the last seven years, I've learned some important lessons about coping with a truly life-altering situation and moving on. And I know what happened to me is probably on the extreme end of the spectrum, but what I've learned isn't. And just as I face challenges in my life, I'm sure all of you have as well. Often when I see good corporations or other groups, I talk about leadership or teamwork or overcoming adversity. And I know you're going to have other uh, breakout sessions on those topics, so I'm going to leave them alone. I just want to spend a couple minutes talking about uh, leading by example. Everyone in this room is a leader, and you have to act like it every day. In Latin, the term is ductus exemplo, and it's a philosophy we hold very deeply in the Marine Corps. There's no better way to motivate others to do something to, than to be out there in front doing it yourself. I told you when I was shot, Colonel de Grosse was on that patrol with us. Many other senior officers of his rank wouldn't be out there on those types of patrols. The Marines in our unit would follow him wherever he wanted to go because they trusted him and were so motivated by him being out there, he was never that officer who was waiting back on base for reports from his junior officers. And leading by example is a core component of taking care of the people around you. It should be easy for everyone in this room to understand that no one is going to want to follow you if you yourself aren't willing to do the things you're asking of the others around you. I made it a priority to lead our team on every night mission, on every patrol, and in every stage of our, of our training leading up to the deployment. Now, I pushed some leadership opportunities down to the lower levels, down to my Marines, when it was appropriate to help develop them as leaders, but I would never ask my Marines to do something I myself wasn't prepared to do. And the same is true for each of you in your chapters. You can't expect your brothers to follow our rules if you yourselves aren't following them all the time. You can't demand ritual proficiency if it's not a priority for you. And you can't expect every brother to show up for the fundraising and the community events if you yourself aren't making an effort to be all of them as well. We view League Marines as a privilege, not a right. It has to be earned every day. And the same is true for you. When you go back to your chapters, I hope you make a renewed effort in leading from the front and leading by example. One thing I know is that life changes, for better or worse. It all depends how you look at it. I choose the glass to be half full, not half empty, and to embrace change. I want to live life in the future, not in the past. I've learned that through inner strength, humility, and a victorious spirit, we're each capable of overcoming the toughest obstacles. Two years ago, with my speech impediment and traumatic brain injury, I never would have imagined being up in front of this many people. So just imagine what each one of your chapters is capable of, whether it's related to community service, academics, or just being leaders on those campuses where you have a strong presence. Now I want to finish up today talking about the Wounded Warrior Project. Through Kappa Sigma's Military Heroes Campaign, Kappa Sigma is going to be supporting WWP in a big way. So I think it's important for you to understand how, it's, how Wounded Warrior Project has helped me individually, but also what it's doing for tens of thousands of other Wounded Warriors on an annual basis all across the country. I first found out about Wounded Warrior Project when I was in the hospital. This is early on. I was in for one of my surgeries. And uh, when I came back, at, at this point now, I've had dozens of facial reconstructive surgeries, but this is early on. 
when I came back to my room, there was one of the Wounded Warrior reps had left a, a t-shirt there for me on my bed. And that shirt meant a lot to me. I still have it today. I still do my yard work in it because it meant to me that someone out there in America who I didn't know cared how I was doing in my recovery. Someone out there was interested and wanted to make sure I was doing okay. So since then, I've participated in a lot of their outdoor events. I've helped with some of their post-traumatic stress symposiums they have, and now, as you heard, I also serve on the board of directors. Over 50,000 service members have combat injuries like me. About 300,000 suffer from traumatic brain injury, and double that suffer from post-traumatic stress. And each one of these warriors have caregivers, family members, children, and friends who are all affected by their injuries. So it's extremely important that groups like WWP exist to help us out today. Wounded Warrior Project's mission is to make today's generation of warfighters the most well-adjusted in the history of America. They take a holistic approach and have, and have programs, as you can see on the slide, focusing on mind, body, engagement with each other, and economic empowerment. In fact, Wounded Warrior Project has 20 national programs, which is far more than any other veteran service organization out there. Just like Kappa Sigma has more chapters and more members than any other return, that's what Wounded Warrior Project is compared to any other veteran service organization. Whether we're talking about outdoor recreational programs, family support programs, nutritional strategies, college classes, employment resources, a fully staff resource center, Wounded Warrior Project does all of this and more. So when you support the Wounded Warrior Project, you're supporting the most widely developed and integrated organization that exists for Wounded Warriors and caregivers today. Now the earlier reports about my injury were that I had been killed in action. And when Corbin Grant rolled me over, I was no longer breathing. So I know that life can be difficult and full of challenges. But take it from me, life is also beautiful and precious and something each of you should treasure, not just get through. Life should be about celebration, not just survival. So you need to turn challenges around and fight through them. I did, and I'm nobody special. Each one of you can as well. Over the last seven years, I've tried to serve as a role model in my Wounded Warrior community. And that way I know I'm pushing myself in the right direction and I'm motivating others around you. I imagine in your daily lives, in your colleges and your universities, and in particular in your chapters, there are plenty of opportunities for you to also lead from the front and to lead by example. Again, gentlemen, thank you for the honor and the opportunity to come speak with you during your conference. And I really want to thank you for supporting the Wounded Warrior Project. As a nonprofit organization that doesn't accept any federal money, we simply couldn't make it happen without people in groups like you. I appreciate you highlighting the issues facing today's Wounded Warriors and choosing to be part of the solution. You should all be proud of yourselves for that. Thanks again, AEKUB. Thank you very much. The Kappa Sigma fraternity wishes to thank Brother Constantine for being here with us today on this very special occasion and for representing the values of the Kappa Sigma fraternity and for what you do each and every day. It's due to your actions and actions of your fellow soldiers that we're able to enjoy the freedoms that we do every day. At this time, I'd like to make a special presentation and a presentation of the Golden Heart Award for valor, bravery, and courage shown in service of your country. On behalf of the Kappa Sigma fraternity, it is my honor to present the 23rd Golden Heart Award presented in the history of the Kappa Sigma fraternity. Brother Constantine, we love and appreciate you, brother. Wow. Wow. Thank you very much, all of you. Thank you so much.